You may remember that the premise for our short series, Hope for an Era of Anxiety, is that in spite of our technical sophistication, our medical advances and our high-powered scientific and academic capabilities, we do somehow seem to live in an age characterised by anxiety. And I suspect that has been taking root from uncomfortable uncertainty. According to Dan Gruper and Jack Nitschke in Nature Reviews Neuroscience 2013, uncertainty diminishes how efficiently and effectively we can prepare for the future and thus contributes to anxiety. Comprehensive information about the probability, timing and nature of a future negative event promotes more efficient allocation of our resources, but such information is rarely available owing to the inherent uncertainty of the future. Now, as we've noted from the beginning of this series, people can't survive long without hope. It is, after all, hope that keeps us going through both our present painful experiences and our anticipatory fear of what the future might hold for us. And in our communication of the gospel, that is, of the good news that Jesus brings to our era of anxiety, I fear we may have soft-pedaled this important element of hope. And so much of the Christian hope hinges on the resurrection and its achievements. In my work for a group as a rural chaplain, I come across a lot of folks who would admit they could do with a bit of hope. People are looking for it. They're not always necessarily in all the right places. Today we're going to do a quick case study on Thomas the Twin and ask how hope can dawn for a person crippled by the loss of hope. And in doing so, we'll be asking the question, what is it that moves a person from disappointment, disillusionment and anxiety to hope? How does a person who is short on positive thoughts come to a position of hope by becoming a Christian? And how does a person come to make the change? Well, first of all, then, we've got to look at the psychology of a doubter. Let's examine the anatomy of Thomas's unbelief. We're looking at John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. Now, Thomas also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord! But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Thomas told that Jesus told him, Because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, what you've got going on there in Thomas is a really rapid shift of position. What brought it about? What is going on in that man's head? Well, to be perfectly honest, the Gospels haven't really got a lot to tell us about Thomas. In John eleven sixteen, when the disciples are a bit wary of following Jesus in the direction of Jerusalem, where they feared for Jesus' safety and for theirs, it was Thomas who loyally, if rather negatively, persuaded them. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> now, I think some people uh, think Didymus means doubter, but uh, Thomas in Aramaic and Didymus in Greek both mean twin. I, I don't know any more about his family relationships than that, but it seems safe to say Thomas might have been a twin. And how he got on with his sibling, we don't know. But he certainly had a fairly grim, but nonetheless, very definite loyalty to Jesus Christ. Then we read in John chapter 14, verse 15, that after Jesus has been trying to prepare his disciples for his own departure, talking about his father having a house that Jesus was going to go to in order to prepare a place there for his disciples as well, Thomas simply didn't seem to get any of it. We can reckon Thomas was not expecting to be an eyewitness of the resurrection or any of the good news that came along after the crucifixion. But Thomas was headed for a shock. And that makes sense of the first thing we need to notice about the incident we're looking at in John 20, 24 to 29 today. He wasn't expecting any of this. Notice first, please, that in the first instance, Thomas was absent when Jesus turned up. 
At first, when Jesus went and appeared to his disciples, Thomas was nowhere around. That says a lot. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. He wasn't there to see this momentous event that the Lord had spent a lot of effort trying to prepare them all for. I find that surprising, but the books tend to suggest that I shouldn't. Milne, in his Message of John, page 302, he suggests the death of Jesus was such an overwhelming reality that he must get alone to try to come to terms with it. So when Jesus comes to the disciples on Easter evening, Thomas is not there. I suppose that does make sense of the situation. I'm just expecting Thomas to have stuck around there with the Twelve simply because I know how the story is going to end. But whatever the case, the fact is that the same Thomas who'd shown such great loyalty when he wanted to stick with Jesus on the journey up to Jerusalem was far from wanting to stick with the disciples after the traumatic events of the crucifixion. It was too much for him. The powers in the land had crucified the Lord. He thought the game was up and no doubt expected that together in a huddle, if once caught, that was going to be a risky place to be. He wasn't there. But then another window opens into Thomas's psychology. He was reluctant to believe the other disciples' testimony. The other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord! <laughs> I suppose they meant that to be an encouragement for their possibly slightly pessimistic and now, no doubt, rather downcast companion. Did you notice the other disciples were so blown away by seeing the risen Jesus that they take no pains at all to meet Thomas where Thomas was, down in the dumps, but trumpeted the cheerful truth in his downcast ear. If he was of a pessimistic disposition, let's go up with him that we may also die with him, does to my mind suggest a pessimistic disposition. And if he is in a downcast frame of mind after the crucifixion, then that blurted message, we've seen the Lord, might be almost guaranteed to be heard as something else. Something more like, Jesus came, but you missed the party, you loser. <laughs> you see what I mean? You put a cheerful message on a, a downcast canvas and it, 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 it looks pretty dark. Thomas's anxiety at the situation and discouragement with events isn't going to be helped at all by what he hears. And so he immediately starts laying down conditions for faith. Rather than accepting his friend's testimony to their joyful experience then, Thomas laid down conditions for coming to believe. This is typically blunt and straightforward, given what we've heard already from Thomas. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's John chapter 20, verse 25, tail end of verse 25. Pretty clear, Thomas was well up to speed with what had happened at the crucifixion. He knows what went on, and it was lethal. He knows that too. No one could have received the wounds that Thomas is describing and lived. It wasn't happening. So, if Thomas could see and actually touch a living body that had received wounds like those, then that would show that he was neither dealing with an imposter nor a inverted commas, ghost of some sort. A living person carrying those tangible wounds whilst looking and sounding like his familiar Jesus was pretty likely to be the real resurrected Jesus. But the slightly pessimistic and traumatised and downcast Thomas was not going to believe any of this nonsense otherwise. Well, we'll get to what happens, but just for a moment, let's stop and bring this Thomas into our contemporary experience. Let's just for a minute try and encounter our contemporary Thomases. Where are they? I'm not the only person to suggest this, but there are clear parallels between the psychology and behaviours of Thomas and our contemporary anxious and, strictly speaking, hopeless, sceptical society. Of all the facts of our faith that give comfort and hope to this age of anxiety, the resurrection is the great big humdinger. And here's Thomas doubting and depressing himself over that one. But look, please notice this. Many people in the world all around us doubt the resurrection, as Keller puts it, on the basis of basis of temperament as much as reason. That's in his Hope in Times of Fear, page 92, which is coming out, I think, in a few weeks' time. Thomas certainly seems to be the type of person who goes with his gut rather than just rationalising things through, but he still defends his position behind a wall of, after the event, reasoning. And Keller is suggesting that it's on the basis of temperament as much as on the basis of reason that he rejects the possibility of a resurrected Jesus. Now, 
let's put it like this, if I may, and, and I'm trying to be delicate. Rural people tend, in my experience, to be more transparent with the reasons they use to reject the facts of the faith than people who've done much with university and who live in towns. I've done university. I have lived in a town. But actually, my experience of people who've done a lot with university and who live in towns tends to make me think that this sort of behaviour, deciding for non-rational reasons, then rationalising it all afterwards, is a human rather than a university-acquired trait. People tend to be sceptical about the facts of the faith, as Tim Keller puts it, on the basis of temperament as much as reason. I'd want to go further. I want to say that behind the most intellectual arguments against the facts of the faith and the life-giving hope of the resurrection is a major one of those facts, there often lies a matter of temperament that drives the passion of the intellectual debate. And it's often the protection of cherished sin that's been fixed deep down in the personality that drives the expression of that temperament and disposition. I'm suggesting people don't often, often, for the most part, they don't decide where they stand with the Lord Jesus Christ simply on the basis of intellectual considerations. And that will have massive implications for how we commend faith to unbelieving people. Because if that's the case, we may find intellectual apologetics alone is not going to change a thing. We will probably still have to open some ears a bit at the start when people object that dead people simply can't come back to life. And Thomas, in common with many Jewish people of his day, would have expected at an intellectual level a general resurrection at the end of the age, like Martha in John eleven twenty four. you know, when she says to the Lord, I know he, that is Lazarus, will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But now, here and now, he wasn't having that. He's got preconceived ideas about that. Thomas clearly needed some in-depth teaching to correct his understanding of individual eschatology, as we may well be tempted to think of people in our day. But interestingly, Thomas did not get any of that from the Lord at all. The Lord took a very different tack and addressed underlying issues in Thomas's psychology, rather than rationalise at an intellectual level, but we'll come to that. There may be one more shared feature between Thomas and our contemporary sceptics. There may well also be a heartfelt fear of disappointment. A sort of longing for this to be true, but not daring to think it might be, because the pain of disappointment, if hope were to be confounded, is simply too painful to contemplate. It's the voice that says, don't get my hopes up, it'll be too painful. And you and I too might be no stranger to the sorts of things that from the little we learn of him in scripture, we suspect may also have been real issues for Thomas when it came to faith. A worldview that says it can't happen. We've seen Thomas as part of that. A temperament that predisposes to scepticism or even cynicism. We've seen Thomas has got, Thomas has got plenty of this, uh, this doubt going on. And thirdly, a heartfelt fear of disappointment. Hardly daring to think that this could possibly be true. And all that ranged against the clear eyewitness testimony of close and trusted friends of long standing. We see those things in our people, our people who lack hope. Their worldview can't happen. It's not scientific. <laughs> A lot of things happen that are not scientific. A temperament that predisposes to scepticism or cynicism. It's, it is even quite trendy in many circles in our society, isn't it? A heart fearful of disappointment. Oh, do we see that? I hardly dare believe it. So in summary, the strange thing begins to seem to be that not that Thomas came to faith, but that he hadn't already on the basis of a friend's testimony. And yet we can find ways to explain that, not based on the evidence available to him, but on the basis of his preconceived ideas, personal temperament and disposition, and then his fear. I'm suggesting, my friends, that, that, that those are things that we need to address in our personal witness to Christ. Building hope in the folks who inhabit our strange era of anxiety. Not to be put off by the technical and intellectual arguments, but to see the person underneath. Their worldview, their temperament, their heart fears. Those need to be addressed on the journey from doubt to faith. So, so we've looked at the psychology, the anatomy of the psychology of a, a, a person like Thomas, who finds it hard to believe at first. Now let's have a look at what we can learn from Thomas's journey from doubt to faith. Funnily enough, Thomas's journey from doubt to faith contains none of our accustomed things like, you know, historical evidence for the resurrection, which I'm sure I would have put in there first up. 
But the path he took from deepest doubt ended up in clearest faith, perhaps the clearest profession of faith of all in the New Testament. John 20, 28. Thomas said to him, that is to Jesus, my Lord and my God. What? That's an amazing turnaround, which surely must give us amazing hope. It's a pretty big journey, and it seems to be completed extremely quickly. In fact, it, it's so striking, some consider this to be the climax of the Gospel of John here. The arch doubter finds crystal clear commitment, born of faith, in the Lord's physical resurrection. How did that happen? Well, it seems to me to have happened in just about three significant steps. Firstly, Thomas received apostolic testimony. First of all, Thomas heard he was now in the room. And then Thomas accepted, he took it on board for himself, the testimony of the apostles. In this case, they said, verse 25, we've seen the Lord. Indeed they did, and indeed they had. The significant change is that by verse 28, Thomas has renounced publicly his earlier hostile reception to that suggestion. Now that Thomas has seen and heard from the Lord, there's no possibility Thomas was going to need first to get really hands-on with Jesus. Jesus invited it. He said, put your hand here, feel these wounds and have a look. But there's no hint that Thomas paused to check the nail holes before confessing, proclaiming his faith in Jesus. Look, Thomas put his faith in Jesus, having abandoned his own previous preconditions. He met Jesus and hope dawned over the cynic's previous scepticism. Why was that? How do you get to that? Well, you read the eyewitness testimony to Jesus, who still speaks faith to doubt through the pages of his word. I mean, John's gospel is a great place to start. Start at the beginning, get past the first chapter, and it gets a bit more um, straightforward to, 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 to get on board with. I mean, there's the place to look to the word in which he speaks. But if you need to, you could read something like Richard Borkham's Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, the Gospels as eyewitness testimony. He proves that the Gospels don't bear the telltale signs of fictional storytelling, but of eyewitness accounts. OK, Thomas had the same eyewitnesses telling him that Jesus had been raised that we have, the Gospels writing apostolic team. But secondly, he came quickly to see that Jesus did not merely rise from the dead, but rose from the dead for him, for Thomas, for you, for me instigating the response that we read in verse 28. Thomas accepted the apostolic eyewitness testimony, having got hold of it. But then Thomas made the good news personal. He says, my Lord and my God. And for those who do this Greek stuff, hokurios mu kai hotheos mu. It, to my mind, that sounds pretty emphatic. Lord of mine, God of mine. And it sounds like it should be a song by City of Light or something, doesn't it? You know, one of those contemporary contemporary songs. Lord of mine and God of mine. I, maybe we can suggest, suggest it to them before I start getting sidetracked into trying to write lyrics. Can you see what's happening here? This is not the Lord. This is my Lord. This is not the God who's out there somewhere. Crucially, crucially, this is my God that springs from Thomas's lips. What swung it for him? When Jesus appeared that second time, as it was to the disciples, Thomas had now been given sufficient credibility to be with them the next time the Lord joined them in their private meeting place. He turned directly to the doubter, did the Lord, and he invited Thomas directly to put his hand in the wound sites and check him out. And immediately Thomas made his confession of faith on the Lordship and deity of Christ. Where did that suddenly and decisively come from? Well, Leon Morris suggests what swung it for Thomas was not the wounds, but the words of the Saviour. Not the wounds, but the words. What the Lord said to Thomas showed that the Lord was well aware of the things Thomas had said when the Lord wasn't visibly present. Which must mean that he had been there, present, but totally unseen. You see, Jesus had been as committed to being with Thomas, whether seen or unseen. And Christ had committed himself to walk with Thomas as his disciple. And hearing Thomas's refusal to believe his friend without tangible proof for himself, he acted. Seeing the cynicism and anxiety in Thomas's heart, he stepped in. Jesus still came to Thomas as requested, and requested none too graciously as that, unless I see. Jesus might as well have voiced what was going on like this. He might have said, I know all about your doubts, your fears, your broken promises and all your flaws and the way you've walked away. 
I've seen right into the deepest pit of your soul. But I still love you, you anxious and miserable thing. And look, knowing and seeing all of that, I'm still here for you. And I'm doubling back when you don't deserve it so you can walk with me. Now you can take this or leave it as you wish, but Keller suggests he originally wanted to see the wounds as evidence of Jesus's power. And now he saw them for what they really were. Evidence of Jesus's love, his sacrificial love for him. Interestingly, Jesus has one more little thing to put to posterity. Uh, and it, it, it relates to this, the blessing of not having seen but believed. There is blessing in believing, says Jesus, without having seen all that Thomas was privileged to see and, and then believe. Hopelessness and anxiety breed scepticism. They often don't dare to believe what they possibly quite liked it. Now, as a missionary, if you like to rule people who are often non-literate, which means that they don't read much, not that they cannot read, non-literate, not illiterate, and who may well think profoundly, but often don't decide on the basis of analytical thought, I tend to believe that our concentration as UK evangelicals in the last 50 years is good, but not as universally helpful as you might think. It can unintentionally de-emphasise the way the process by which many biblical characters came to faith. As a simple miracle, the resurrection is spectacular and the evidence we have for it is formidable. I'm convinced by the evidence for Christ's bodily resurrection from the dead. And I see that as the climax of the way that we were provided with the potential for salvation, the means of the defeat of our two most anxiety-inducing and greatest enemies, sin and death. But it is the means of the restoration of my personal relationship with the all-seeing, all-knowing, even me-loving God, that the restoration starts to happen in my life. As the spirit he sends brings me to Christ, the Christ who gives me hope and help, and even the wholeness born of holiness. We're trying to say this, that once Thomas saw and heard Jesus, all his preconditions for faith, to touch his wounds and so on, fell instantly aside because what Jesus said showed that Jesus knew exactly what a failure Thomas had been and loved Thomas and wanted to reach out to him anyway. What swung it for Thomas was relational, not rational. Does that make sense? Now, the rational is important, but the relational swings it, wins Thomas's heart and mind. And yet, better to not have seen all Thomas had seen and exercise greater faith in God and trust in the eyewitness testimony. Because seeing is not always believing, but the Lord delights in the believing, which to that person counts as seeing. Let's bring it to a conclusion. There is hope in our era and in our experience of circumstantial anxiety, and it, it rotates in the Christian faith around the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And that hope lies not in relished and in nurtured scepticism and cynicism. For many of us, that is what we turn from to Christ. We turn from nurtured scepticism and sometimes even fashionable cynicism to come to Christ. And if you're the theological type, then repentance is the word we use for this, this thing here, this turning. And cynicism and scepticism might be what we need to repent of to come to Christ. Thomas did. We don't need the same experience Thomas had, but we do need to make the same discovery Thomas made. And to personalise that trust in Christ and his resurrection, which revolutionised the life of Thomas, putting hope in his heart, a hope that sent him out, we understand to take the good news he'd learned about Christ to the subcontinent of India, giving his life in that cause with joy and purpose, which in itself feeds hope. Joy and purpose to make the living Lord known. And that was his path from doubt to faith, from fear and anxiety to hope and joy as he walked on with the Lord.